Hello. Uh, I think I'm, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm Phil Campbell. Uh, I am delighted to be here uh, and there, uh, wherever there is. Uh, I, uh, I've been very interested in how the perception of uh, uh, myself and everyone else as a human being uh, uh, has changed uh, following the pandemic and how it will continue to change. Uh, I, um, I hope you can see the slides okay. I uh, uh, have been teaching now for a few years, uh, and I always start with uh, what I want to talk about today, which is uh, called the vortex, for want of a better word. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I've had many careers. I'm that old. Uh, I, uh, I'm an architect by profession. Uh, I'm a terrible poet. Uh, I've been a game designer for over 25 years. Uh, I started a, a, an AR, augmented reality company, probably eight years too soon. Uh, that's eight years uh, PPG, I think, which is pre-Pokemon Go, um, which might have changed everything. Uh, uh, I, I, I now teach. Uh, I'm, a te I'm a professor at Berkeley City College and Cogswell uh, University of Silicon Valley. Um, I... I'm going to talk about uh, some design concepts in relation to the pandemic. Uh, I can really only uh, look at them through the lens of being an architect or a game designer. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a philosopher or a scientist or a, a politician, even uh, any of those important jobs. Uh, so uh, what I specifically I'm doing is looking at the human condition uh, in relation to how we perceive ourselves. Uh, within our environment, how we perceive others, uh, and how that uh, adapts and adjusts us, and then translating that to the world of uh, design and game design architecture. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is called the vortex. Uh, it's been something that's been with me for a long, long time. Uh, it's a, a concept of uh, you, the human being, uh, and your relationship to the world around you. Um, uh, it's, I, uh, oh, by the way, I'm coming to you from sunny San Francisco uh, and I'm Irish, so I have a tendency to ramble. Uh, and so hopefully I'll get to the end of my slide deck this time. Um, it's a tight timeline. Uh, the vortex, uh, makes an assumption that you're the nucleus of your own vortex. Uh, that sounds very self involved, but in fact, you'll see that it's very much the opposite direction where, uh, you're a nucleus that are, are, are really mixing with the world around you. Uh, and the notion is that uh, at any given moment in time, uh, you uh, are perceived differently by other people and you have a different perception of yourself. Now, this sort of thinking uh, started with me uh, when, when I was leaving college, what, what about a hundred years ago? Uh, and it stuck with me ever since. Um, and I've experimented with it in, uh, in life, in architecture, in games, uh, but mostly relating it to games. So, you know, take that with a pinch of salt. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it, it was all inspired by this. Uh, it's a book by uh, uh, an Irish writer uh, whose pen name was uh, Flan O'Brien. It's called The Third Policeman. Now, I know you're not supposed to read out your own slides, but I have the accent for this, so I feel that I can. Uh, how can I convey the perfection of my comfort on the bicycle, the completeness of my union with her, the sweet responses she gave me at every particle of her frame? I felt that I had known her for many years and that she had known me and that we understood each other utterly. Uh, it, there's a lot of incredibly meta uh, surreal concepts launched in this book, which is a very, very funny book. Uh, and one of the key concepts that stuck with me was the idea that we weren't necessarily defined. Uh, what constituted us as a human being was not the edge of our skin, was not uh, where our body ends, as it were. Uh, that wasn't a hard surface, that our molecules were constantly mixing with the world around us. And the basic premise of this part of the book was that uh, these Irishmen are cycling around the village constantly on their bicycles. Uh, and the molecules are mixing up so much that eventually the Irishmen become more bicycle uh, and the bicycles become more Irishmen uh, because of that mix. Uh, so by the end, I don't want to give it all away, but 
but the Irishmen, you walk around the village and the Irishmen are all propped up against the wall because they're more like bicycles uh, and the bicycles are chasing the uh, lovely woman of the uh, village around trying to get dates. Um, and so this, this stuck with me, the idea that uh, if you were to consider yourself the nucleus of a vortex, what the perception of you as a human being uh, was constantly changing based on what was around you at any given time, what you were seeing, smelling, tasting, uh, who you were standing beside, what environment you were in. And uh, in trying to translate this to games, uh, uh, to figure out by proxy uh, what you're, how you were reacting with your first person avatar or your third person avatar, uh, the notion was uh, very simply stated uh, that uh, you considered yourself moving in a three meter, a uh, three foot, uh, radius of space. Now that you'll see later how this uh, relationship has changed when we when we start to consider our our six feet of separation. Uh, so everything you do uh, at any given moment in time uh, is influenced by your environment, by your proximities. Um, and so in in putting this into action uh, in in games, uh, I'll I'll start with. Um, this 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 uh, cheesy little sketch here uh, led to this project. I, I've got to thank the uh, Brazil Campuseros for inviting me. Uh, but uh, just as an example, uh, the the notion that how could we influence that space around us? How could we influence? How could we make it clearer? Now, obviously, these theories have developed over time. Uh, AR is a really good example of us becoming more ex uh, having a more extended life. Uh, I teach design thinking as well, and you know the concept of the persona, uh, empathy maps, all seek to draw your influences in around you to actually help shape you as a human being. Uh, so this was a very simple concept for uh, Guyana uh, in Pernambuco. Uh, it was a, a sort of so social, cultural world, spiritual world, uh, where every avatar in the game was a reflection of you, and uh, you had a system called Emblemus. Now, Emblemus were a way of showing everything you'd achieved, everything you'd done in the game, everything you'd listened to, uh, and they were a display. They opened up like a peacock. Uh, and it really was inspired by uh, taking part in uh, in uh, Caboclino, uh, I hope my pronunciation is correct, uh, parades and being there in Brazil for a time, uh, listening to the sound of the Maracatu drummers, uh, and all the various spir spiritual aspects of that life. Um, so basically trying to apply the notion that you're more than just your skin and bones. Uh, I actually, at the time, uh, uh, there was a big deal about Second Life. Everybody was using Second Life, the, the, the program. Uh, but I was really more concerned with your first life. And that's why I ultimately got into augmented reality. But but really throughout my career, uh, I, I've tried to apply the notion that you can uh, extend uh, your vortex, you can encompass different things in your vortex. Sometimes it's done in a very simple way. I know this looks like a video game, but it's actually architecture. Uh, uh, this was a competition for a theme park. I, I designed a lot of theme parks. and. Um, uh, the idea was once we discovered that the client himself actually felt that he was Santa, uh, the idea was to try and immerse him, immerse him in our scheme, in our competition scheme, by creating this huge drawing that actually filled his desktop. So you can see there that that's the notion of his arm uh, inhabiting the drawing and drawing him into the vortex of this drawing. Uh, you can see a, a rolled up example of our actual uh, competition drawings. You can see Santa's comic collection the keys to his Vespa, uh, uh, it, it, it worked because uh, we won the competition, but uh, uh, it was the idea that somehow we'd inhabited his headspace and somehow we'd drawn ourselves into his vortex and what, what constituted him at any given moment in time. Uh, I, I was a, uh, for a time, I was a senior designer at Legoland in Windsor, and the fools actually let me design a vortex for real and actually built it. Um, and this really was the notion of how this vortex could be translated into this theme park. So you joined the vortex of the theme park. Uh, you can see that all the design, if you can see the slides clearly, uh, w was designed to draw you into the park and propel you through it. All the buildings were thrown off from the vortex. Uh, 
It also uh, uh, had a had a fun design decision where um, so this was a royal park at Windsor, and some of the trees were accidentally knocked down. Uh, and they asked me what could we put there, and I. Just off the top of my head, I said, uh, oh, a dinosaur. And, of course, they built it. They can build anything in Lego. So uh, so uh, it's not often in life you get to make decisions like that. Uh, in relation to games, though, uh, it's, it's very interesting because when you consider that your third-person avatar or your first person uh, is a proxy for you in the game or for the character you're playing, how do you deal with the game space? How do you relate your player to the environment? so that it becomes more meaningful and so that ultimately you can make more meaningful actions and you can appear and behave more appropriately for that character, whether you're playing a character or yourself. Uh, how do you deal with something like that in one of our earliest projects, in like an Escher world where there's at least four dimensions? How does my avatar relate and see that world? Uh, so let me look at some examples of the things I worked on. Uh, and some of the systems that have gone before, and I've kind of called it modular humanity, uh, and figuring out how there may be a system for translating this vortex of space around you as a human being, translating that into games, and seeing how that uh, made your avatar or, or your first person self uh, react. Uh, and systems of proportions obviously are not new. Uh, uh, Vitruvian Man uh, by Leonardo, uh, the, supposedly the, the perfect human form, and of course, uh, the modular by uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, Le Corbusier uh, actually met with Einstein in 1946, and this is what Einstein had to say about the modular uh, scale of proportions, which makes the bad difficult and the good easy. And so, in an effort to look for something like this, where there's a true connection between you, your avatar, your persona, and the environment, to make ultimately make your actions more appropriate. Uh, I uh, uh, looked at how well this had been done in Tomb Raider. So this is my own small uh, contribution, uh, part of my contribution to the Tomb Raider world. I, I worked on Tomb Raider for about five years. Uh, and this is a, a journey for Lara here that takes her from Scotland to the Channel Tunnel, very exciting, and to a French zoo. Uh, and it was loosely based on Joan of Arc and various other mythologies, Planet of the Apes. Uh, originally, I designed this for Northern Ireland, uh, but of course the powers that be said that Northern Ireland was not glamorous enough, so it had to be Scotland. Of course, uh, Game of Thrones would dispute that now. I think we're plenty glamorous enough. Um, and Tomb Raider was key uh, in this sense, in the shaping of the modular, because it was about proportions, right? Not Probably not the proportions you're thinking about. And these are various uh, versions of Lara through time. But what it was was the relationship of the Lara avatar to her environment as built in the engine and the tools for the game. And now this, this looks like Minecraft now or something. This is from about 1998. It's 99. Uh, and uh, it's a very simple system. And the big difference here was that instead of it being like a building system now, like Unreal or Unity, where everything is planes and shapes and you, and you put those things together, uh, this was like sculpting from the inside. It was like one of those executive toys where you put your hand on the nails uh, and leave an impression. So you were sculpting Lara's world from the inside. But here was the thing. Every single movement of square you can see that that the module of that is squares it later became triangles uh as it grew more sophisticated and this was developed by the core design team in derby uh in england um and uh you'll see that uh every time you move a square lara it works in proportion right so lara could always jump a certain amount she could standing jump a certain distance she could climb, she could jump up a certain distance, she could swim, shoot, etc. All of her movements were geared to the actual environment that was being built around her. And so the beauty of this was you couldn't make a mistake. Uh, as a designer of these levels, you couldn't fail in a way. You couldn't make a space that was impossible. There was no ambiguity about anything. Uh, you could see uh, exactly if Lara could make a jump or a running jump or swallow dive or whatever it was. Um, but more to this, and one of the things that I think made the game so uh, 
so popular was the idea that the player couldn't fail either. It was very legible. It was always clear what was the appropriate thing to do generally. I mean, something like Uncharted nowadays is a very uh, beautiful game, but much harder to read because it's so much more realistic and so much more, uh, just more advanced in technology. Uh, but they ended up, I think, having to paint white lines, you know, where you could jump, where you could do. But in this game, as you develop the game in this series of pushing out of squares, uh, you knew that you could not make something that Lara would feel. So the player would never feel that sense of failure. I mean, you could miss a jump, but you had a great sense of uh, empowerment uh, as a character in this world. So I think that the ultimately the proportion of Lara and the proportion of her figure and her moves in relation to the game meant she had a really strong connection to her environment. Uh, and this harken back to, to my views on the vortex where we are at any given moment in time, how we are perceived as a human being and how we perceive ourselves as a human being is altered by the things that surround us. Um, uh, and so <clears throat> that ends up leading to appropriate behavior. For, for a few years, I was a creative director on James Bond uh, at EA, and we we're constantly figuring out what James Bond would do. Right? What was the appropriate behavior for James Bond? And we started designing things, uh, you know, in big moments. Uh, James Bond dives over a, uh, over a building and rappels down because that's what he would do. Or he fights a bunch of uh, tanks in the elevator. That's what Bond would do. Because at any given moment, if Bond couldn't open a locked door or tripped on a curb or slid off a roof unless he wanted to, it broke the spell, it broke the illusion of being uh, James Bond. Uh, and I developed Bond in, in both first and third person. So constantly you're thinking about what is the vortex around Bond, the avatar in the game? And consequently, how, how does that relate to the humanity that's driving it? Uh, uh, and so every design and every aspect of these designs that I've tried to create uh, are related to uh, the appropriateness of the behavior, uh, how they relate to their environment around them. What, what might that avatar be seeing? What might that avatar be smelling or understanding or witnessing? Who's in proximity to that avatar? How does that affect how the uh, enemies and the antagonists uh, relate to that character? What are they seeing? Um, uh, and sometimes uh, uh, the, the goal could be, this is one of the first open world games. Uh, we got some, some of things right. At Omicron, the Nomad Soul. Uh, it was a great excuse to get David Bowie into a game. But sometimes your synergy with your world can be can be complete. Uh, you were tasked in this game with playing about 50 characters, I think, in total, uh, inhabiting their souls. And in every juncture, as that character, you had to behave pro appropriately. You were a great fighter or a great singer. Uh, a great puzzle solver, uh, good with robots. Um, and however uh, you related in that design uh, as a character meant um, uh, how you were uh, in tune with your world. And this was a brand new world uh, within your computer. Uh, I remember uh, uh, doing three different techniques here. I, I looked at it from the persona and person point of view, which uh, is on the left, which is basically uh, telling little vignettes, little stories of how the player reacted as he entered environments and as he uh, in, encountered people and what he was seeing and hearing and uh, experiencing. Uh, I also, being an architect, looked at it from the architectural and the environmental point of view. So often, and this may not be the perfect rule for level design, but I often uh, created the environment first, the nature of a factory or a, a big business company like this is particular one in the middle is Konsu, uh, and figured out how that world would influence the player and what the player uh, character would, would do within that world. And if all else failed, there's always the good old trick of designing a level based on a Frenchman's face. Uh, this is, a, a for me, a classic hidden narrative where I, maybe I was mad with my boss, David Cage, at, at one point here, but I find that I could transmogrify his face and create a level. I did give him a cigar uh, to complete the uh, jewel heist in the vault because he didn't smoke, uh, because that was necessary. But uh, again, it was another way of translating that inner hidden story, uh, that nature of how I'm linked into my environment and finding some way, some path to design so you never get stuck. Uh, 
I think considering it now, I think I have about three minutes. Uh, uh, obviously, my mantra had always been three three feet. Uh, uh, there's a three feet uh uh, radius of space around you and everything that's in that uh, space at that given moment uh, is is what makes up you as the person. Uh, it's your relationship to your environment, to your family, to your people around you, the people you're talking to, uh, hugging, uh, whatever the nature of that relationship is. And then translating that to games and architecture and figuring out how that would be perceived in moving through a space in a design or as a character moving around uh, an environment in a game. Uh, now, six feet apart, uh, the new normal, uh, possibly during this pandemic and possibly it's changing life forever. Uh, but again, it caused me to consider uh, uh, the difference with my nucleus, uh, uh, what, I'm, what I'm now considering. And it can be quite literal in my simple-minded way of thinking that that three foot uh, radius translates to six foot. And now my vortex encompasses all that uh, imagined empty space where I am not relating, you know, I am six feet apart from any other human being uh, to be safe. And uh, obviously my first goal is to translate that into video games and figure out if this is the new normal, if this is the way, uh, uh, sorry, cat attack, uh, if this is the way that people normally relate to the world, then obviously translating that into video games, it's going to be different. Uh, there's going to be a different perception of space and the way we deal with people around us, ultimately. Uh, maybe not in the craziest, silliest of games, but really if we're getting more serious about, uh, you know, The Last of Us or something that that has some kind of relationship to human feelings and emotions. Uh, my, my general feeling in closing uh, about uh, being the center of a nucleus, uh, uh, being the nucleus of a vortex that extends out six feet, is uh, it's just something we need to adjust to. Uh, it, it gives us a different perception of our environment and the people around us. Uh, it's not a cause to regress or get isolated or shy or separated uh, because it's a very separating thing. I mean, these things, masks, this looks like somebody's underpants, but it's a mask. Masks are very separating things. You can't even see a smile. But I think my goal would be uh, uh, to project into that space safely. Uh, uh, I know it's the antithesis of what some people are about, but be louder, uh, be, be more colorful, be brighter, uh, you know, wear a top hat. I don't know. Uh, the idea is, is that you have this six feet of space to inhabit, project into it. I mean, obviously, if we all wore visors and those were proved to be medically safe, clear visors rather than masks, people could see our expressions better. It might even magnify our expressions. It's a perfect uh, place for AR to inhabit. I think AR can be very important uh, in, in this now um, uh, in terms of uh, communicating out and incorporating our environment back to us. I, I think so essentially in short, I don't have any life-changing answers, but I think that we have to consider that with our six feet of space, our six feet of separation, we have to consider projecting. We have to consider uh, widening uh, our scope and actually uh, trying to engage with the world in a different way, if that makes any sense. So yeah, if that's, uh, that's it. If there's any questions, uh, always turn to your trusty whiteboard and your pencil marker, your sign pen, uh, keep the world going. Design never stops. And I think I'm on time. I can't see any any uh, other data uh, here. Um, so uh, there's a delay. Okay. Actually, I could knock that off and just get the full me.
I'm very grateful again to have been invited to do this. I, uh, uh, I think it's just worth considering that, that that six feet rule, it's important, but you can fill that space. Uh, and uh, as for me personally, I relate that to my architecture and my uh, video games. But thank you.